It was pretty rough, man, for about three days. You're a proper detoxing. I was like on the floor. It was it was bad, man. It was really, really bad. When guys get here, they tend to act different and their morality and their ethics and all the things they learned, you know, that was good and right in their culture. All that just goes flying out the window. Well, folks, what's the story? I hope you're doing well wherever you are in the world. Pete here from Tyrish Times and today we're going to meet Ed who has spent 19 years in Thailand. His story involves battling alcohol addiction, uh, we're going to talk about where he's, where he's living in Thailand, the cost of living there as well and we're going to get into um, Ed's opinions on some foreign men and their views on Thai women as well as how some foreign men lose their ethics and their morals when they live in Thailand long term. So let's jump straight into it. If you like the video, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and uh, leave me a comment as well. I'm always interested to know what you think of these interviews. That's why I make them, they're for you. Anyway, let's get straight into it. Thanks for coming on here and doing this. I'm excited to hear what you have to say, okay? So you spent 19 years in Thailand. Let's go mm -hmm. back all the way to the very start. Like, How did you end up uh, moving to Thailand and spending 19 years there? Oh, that's a good question. I ask myself sometimes uh, <laughs> when I realize I've spent like more of my adult life here than I did in America. It's like, wow, this, uh, it's kind of weird. Uh, so I moved here when I was like 30 and I was, an, I was, I was originally going to stay here for maybe a year or two. And I, I just finished my graduate school. So I actually came here. Uh, I did my, my graduate studies in mycology, which is uh, based like fungus. So I came here to find like new species of fungus. That was, you know, this being like uh, the tropical part of the world. And uh, I just thought I could find all kinds of new species and get famous, you know, and get my, my name on a bunch of papers and all that stuff. And I, when I came here, the, the guy I was working for it, just um, we were way up in the jungle in Chiang Mai. We didn't have an internet connection. Uh, mobile phones didn't really work unless we went down the road about three kilometers. Um, we didn't really have much access. You know, there was no online literature really at that time. So even if we would have had, an, if we would have had, a, you know, an internet connection, it probably wouldn't have been that great. And it was just really slow and it rained constantly. There was days up there, we were at about 900 meters and there's, there was maybe sometimes three, four days in a row where it would just like not stop raining like ever. <laughs> and so if you're trying to go out, it, it, it sounds like perfect for mushrooms and fungi, but like if you're, if you're going out and it's just pouring down rain, it just makes it miserable. God, I, I was up there for about a year and a half and it just got to be too much. I, I couldn't, I couldn't deal with it anymore. I had to yeah, and then you get down to Chiang Mai on a Friday night, and you're like, wow. We were about 70K up north uh, in, in, in Methang, it's called. It's like a little bit north of Chiang Mai. It was too lonely. I lived with about five or six other students every day, day after day, after day, after day. You're working, eating, going to the field with all the same people, and, you know, tensions start to rise, and, you know, you know, people living with each other. I don't know if you've ever lived with a, a group of people, but, you know, People have their little personal problems with each other and those just get worse and worse and worse and start to escalate. And then finally, some of the students were like moving back to the city and the whole thing just kind of fell apart. And uh, yeah, I, I looked, started looking for jobs and my friend found a post, a Bangkok post. Like, remember when they used to have classifieds? <laughs> There's just a little, little classified ad in the Bangkok post for one of the major universities. And I... I came down to Bangkok and interviewed, and like 30 minutes later, I had a job. <laughs> That's a long story short, but yeah, something like that. You, you spent 19 years in Thailand, and you said you, you got there when you were 30, so that would make you 49 now. You don't look 49. You look very, very, very good for your age. What do you put that down to? Thai living or? Uh, Leo Chang and Marble Reds. <laughs> no way you're not a smoker are you a smoker yeah i I've, I've, I've laid off a lot since i quit drinking i quit drinking like five years ago but i was um i was a pretty heavy drinker for most of my adult life okay so what was the story you 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 were partying hard in thailand and then you decided to quit or what, what was up with that yeah it just got to be too much you know when it it became one of those things like the benefits weren't really worth the the, the costs 
you know, waking up every day kind of like in a daze and, you know, just kind of wait until the end of the day so you can go to dinner and have a drink. And then it just got, uh, yeah, it just got, it got pretty heavy for a while. And then I just decided I was spending way too much money. Um, you know, drinking, it, it's cheap here, but it's too cheap to the point where, yeah, I mean, you lived here, you know, it's fairly acceptable acceptable to be kind of a drunk, <laughs> especially if you're a foreigner, you know, like, Mao, you know, like, you know, they got different words to describe like drunk foreigners. And I really didn't want to fall into that category for the rest of my life. You know, I, I plan on spending my, uh, well, the rest of my life here and I didn't want to be that. 60, 70 year old, you know, Frankie Mao, like, I didn't want to be that person sitting on a bar stool somewhere in, you know, one of these notorious cities, just, you know, just wasting my days away. And if I, if I do, you know, retire, I, I still like working, but if I do retire, I just don't want to be sitting in some little town out in the Isan, you know, at the local bar, just talking to other people that are sitting there drinking all day and afternoon and night. And then, you know, that it just gets boring after a while. And uh, so I just decided it'd be cheaper and probably better for my mental health and probably better for my physical health to just stop drinking. I, I mean, I love I, there. There's no, I have nothing against I, I hang out every day with people that drink like regularly. Um, it's just for me, it was just it was getting to be too much. It was just I was starting to feel like uh, it was affecting my mental health, you know, like, you know, those guys that they just sit at the bar and they just complain about the same stuff every day, day after day after day. And I, I, I noticed I was getting to that point where it was like, there's all negativity, like around me, there's negativity and it's, it's rubbing off on me and I'm just going along with the program, you know, and everything just becomes negative, 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 negative. And that's, it's not really good for your, your mental health. So I just decided to go cold Turkey one day. I was like, had enough. And I just didn't go to the store that day. And then it was pretty rough, man, for about three days. I have to admit, man, I was, I was, uh, I probably should have went to the hospital. <laughs> like oh, I was, so uh, you're, you're a proper detoxing. Yeah, I was, I was like on the floor, like, you know, like it was, it was bad, man. It was really, really bad. Uh, and I had some booze. I had a couple bottles of booze just in case it got like, you know, emergency level bad. Uh, but yeah, I was fully, I was fully in detox mode, man. It was, it was rough. And then after that passed, like probably three days, I was just like, well, guess I'm done with that. Bye-bye. And then every day I had like, you know, 800 bot left in my pocket. I was like, wow, like you do that for a week. That's like, you know, four or 5,000 bot I saved. And it's just like, wow, this is a lot easier than I thought it would be. <laughs> And were you and were you able count. to like drink and then were you so you were a teacher then yeah you were you were like a mm. functioning alcoholic you were able to drink and then go to work the next day yeah that's pretty much what I was functional alcoholic just like all of my friends now <laughs> sorry if they're out there they're gonna hear this I know I know they're gonna hear this probably um some of the people I know they drink way too much but you just don't bring it up they know they drink too much everybody who drinks too much knows they drink too much have you gone back to the states anytime? No, I, you know, I went back once. I think I was here for about a year and a half. It, it might have been, it would have been Christmas time, I think a year and a half after I got here. So the first Christmas I was here, I, I just pushed through because I was broke. I didn't have any money. Uh, and then the second year I went back for Christmas and I, I went back to Michigan for about three weeks and it was so miserable. This is December in Michigan. I mean, after like three days, my nose was bleeding because it was so dry. The backs of my feet were cracking. You know, I lived here for a year and a half and I was used to the humid, warm, you know, in December here. It's still, it's still, you know, I can get a little cool, but it's still fairly warm. But I mean, my elbows were like cracking and I was getting all, you know, like ashy everywhere. <laughs> and then, you know, no, no bum guns like in Michigan. I was like, oh, that was the biggest thing. I was like, what? What? I got to go back to dry toilet paper? Like, come on, this is this is barbaric, you know? I know, I know, man. It's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> You're living in uh, Nakhon Patom. Can you tell everyone where that is? Yeah, it's just, it'll be, uh, oh gosh, I got to do that. It's going to be, uh, what's it, west of Bangkok. If you were going west, um, uh, basically west from Bangkok, the first, the next province you would hit would be Nakhon Patom.
I always consider just like a suburb of Bangkok. I'm not actually too familiar with it, believe it or not. I don't think I've ever, I've driven through it, but I've never really spent any time there. What's life like there? Well, so like I'm right on the edge where I basically, if I go like a half kilometer that way, I'm in Bangkok. Um, it's just, the, there's like a Kong and one side of the Kong is Bangkok, the other is a uh, canal. Uh, one side is Bangkok and the other side is Nakompatom. But if you keep going west, Nakompatom is quite a big province and it's where they have a giant, giant chetty, like a stupa. Ah, uh, yeah, seeing there's that. There's like this really, I think it's the biggest one in Thailand, maybe even the world. Uh, you know, it takes you like half an hour to walk around it. It's just this giant, giant chetty. I guess that that's probably the most famous thing in the Compton. It's a lot of a lot of rice farms and uh, and pig farms and chicken farms. Why did you choose to live there? Oh, uh, where I teach the university basically that I teach at ah, is uh, nice. is here. So it's um so it it's not that far. It's like I don't know if it's any reference, but it takes like fifteen minutes to get to Khao San Road if you want to go to Khao San Road. Fifteen minutes in a cab and you're there. So it's it's very, very um and the buses and everything, all the major bus routes, they come out here and sort of do a loop and then they go back into Bangkok. So it's become sort of like almost like a suburb of Bangkok. The cost of living is probably what, maybe twenty percent, thirty percent uh cheaper than yeah. uh, living in Bangkok. Prob yeah, yeah, that's probably a good 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 estimate. Um and moment mostly it's like the food is cheaper. Um, because the it, it's also where I live. It's a, they sort of cater to the students a little bit, so they're they're kind of trying to get you know they don't want to have just a bunch of you know Westerners or like really really rich Thai people. They they've got to have student prices. Um, there are really really nice restaurants, but it's almost like a mix of like kind of farmer level stuff, you know, and and you get all the all the good like Isan food on basically every street corner and. How about, uh, I know this is a bit of a touchy subject, you don't want to get into too much details about it, but what about relationships uh, over the years? Have you been in, uh, are you in a relationship now? Have you been in, have you been married before or anything like that? Uh, I've never been technically married. Um, I've, I've had, hmm, yeah, this is, um, I've had good ones and bad ones, the same as in the U.S., uh, that's another funny thing is a, a lot of guys here, especially, they tend to really think about Thai women as kind of like different creatures. Like that's, I, I talk about this almost every night with my friends. They're involved with Thai women and and it's always like, they do this, they do that. They're different. And it's like, no, they're not. They're not different. My, I, I've, I've dated and, and been in long-term relationships with, every different you know variety of women women and uh i this may be it i think they're all very very similar <laughs> it doesn't matter to me what color they are what language they speak what what country they grew up in women want security and they want a guy to take care of them and they want to be treated well and i don't think that's much different in the west or in america or probably in ireland or asia some guys like to focus on the differences and oh, that's Thai women. And I, I really, it kind of, it gets a little bit boring to listen to it over and over and over again. I mean, I hear this like daily, like it's, it's my evening here. I might go out a little bit later and I'm going to hear the same stories about the same thing that I heard last night and the night before. And it's, it's entertaining. It's something to pass the time, but some guys really, really focus on the differences. And that's what really bugs me is there's nothing really different. I mean, basically different between a Thai woman and a Western woman. Um, but they like to use that as an excuse for maybe their indiscretions and the way they act. So it's it's a lot easier if if they don't act right, they can blame it on a woman. Or, or I'm gonna see, I'm gonna get in trouble with some of my friends. <laughs> It's like sometimes I just want to say the problem isn't the woman. The problem is you, <laughs> you know, like you act differently here. You know, when guys get here, for some reason, they, they tend to act different and their morality and their ethics and all the things they learned, you know, that was good and right in their culture. And, and you know, maybe even their religious views, all that just goes flying out the window. And, you know, they walk down the street and they just see beautiful women everywhere. And that's like, they just, it's, it's like overload for them. And then they just like sort of. 
any stories that like stand out in your mind uh, from the people that you've met uh, and other foreigners in Thailand that you've met over the years? Yeah, uh, gosh, probably the guys who do this stereotypical thing and they meet a girl and then they, they think they're going to be happy out in, in the rice field somewhere. And they move out there and they build a house and they think they're going to own the land and they you know, the typical thing, like foreigners can't own land here. And so they end up having, you know, some agreement with their partner. And then usually after that goes south, they end up with nothing. I mean, I, I hate to even bring it up because it's kind of depressing, but it's it happens often. Um, so you get the guys who, who might come over and they, they start, what do they call them, like sponsors and things like that. And, you know, they're back, they're back in their home country you know, nine, 10 months of the year and they're, they're supporting or sponsoring a woman over here. And you see what that woman does when they're not here. And it's just like, you, you can't tell them, right. You know, I mean, that, that stuff doesn't really go around where I live because I live near a university. So you don't really see that much here, but when I go on vacation and you know, you're, you meet some guy or some, but you see him here and he's just, you know, he's on cloud nine. And then, you know, when he leaves, you're going to see his missus like, back in the same place doing the same thing and you know what are you going to do are you going to tell them like ah, it's just a, a sticky situation and then I, I have a lot of friends too i mean can kind of combine with the the women that i've had experiences with um as well as some of my friends um people want to have a partner and and they find a partner but then you have so many options here that a lot of the guys who have a partner they end up having multiple partners, which again is something back in the West you can't do, right? You you know, they have, in Thailand, they have special words for things like a, a minor wife, you know, like you got a me annoy and like a geek and like they have special words for your, you know, your F buddy and the one you see on the weekends and the one you, and then they have special words for this. And it's it's not only Westerners that do this stuff, obviously. It's part of the culture here, but a lot of the Westerners that come here, they embrace that. Like, wow, like I can have 10 girls numbers in my phone, you know, like you can't do that in the West. <laughs> and and a lot of guys, they just they have like they have mommy issues, you know, they want they want they want somebody to take care of them. And Thai women are very, very, very good at filling the role of mommy, lover you know, guardian, secretary, like, you know, grocery shopper, cook, like Thai women fill all those roles. And I, I, you know, it's, it's, a uh, it's hard not to like that. It's hard not to like that. Do you ever feel lonely in Thailand? Yeah. <laughs> um, sometimes. Yeah. I, I think it, Oh, I don't know. I struggle with this. I've always been a little bit of a loner my entire life. And I've never really had like a lot of close friends. You know, usually I can count maybe five to 10 people that I would really consider to be friends. But yeah, I would say it does get a little bit lonely. Um, and maybe that's why I wanted to. It's part of the reason I stopped drinking, because for a lot of people here, their best friend becomes a bottle. You know, and that's um that's a dangerous road to go down, uh, especially if you if you live here and you, you you continue to live here. It's um, I mean, I don't want this to sound like all anti-alcohol or anything. I'm not I'm not anti-alcohol by any means, but when you're you're somebody like me, you probably might have a genetic disposition towards it, uh, predisposition. Um, you know, like looking at a bottle and thinking that's your best friend is maybe not not the best way to go about sadness or loneliness. I watch a lot of other guys and their YouTube channels and I've noticed that a lot of them um, a lot of them will at will from time to time put out one of those videos they're standing in a rice field somewhere over in Isan or up north and they're just standing in that you know and they've got their 10 million bot house behind them and they've got this beautiful landscape and they are lonely. Because when you don't speak Thai and you don't have any other people around you who can speak English, it, it can be very, very lonely. You you start to cabin fever, right? You can you can feel cabin fever. And and like you probably know, even in Bangkok, a city of 10, 15 million people, you can stand in the middle of the street and be the loneliest person in the world. 
you know, you're just standing there and you realize that, wow, I don't know any of these people. I don't know what to say to them. They're not going to talk to me. All, all it is is just this mass of people moving around you and you feel lonely. So are you, you're still a teacher at the moment, yeah? Yeah. And yeah. you have an interesting hobby. What's your hobby? <laughs> My hobby is growing fungus. I forgot. <laughs> growing <laughs> fungus. I, I've been doing mushroom stuff for, for like 30 years. I, I grew up basically uh, growing and, and, and finding mushrooms in the forest. Whew, it's kind of a big topic. I don't know. I'm trying to trying to bounce around, uh, be be uh, be delicate here, you know. But yeah, there's some. Um, a lot of people are really, um, as far as the the special medicinal ones go, people are really, really starting to realize that the decades of SSRIs and antidepressants and and all these, you know, um, these pills that have been being fed to them by their doctors and by the pharmaceutical industry maybe they're not doing what they were intended to do anymore um you know i mean you you've got people now that are that are addicted to pills that may or may not be helping them um they're depressed you know they have ptsd they have trd you know treat sorry, some of these acronyms you know they have depression and they don't know they don't know what to do and so a lot of people are getting away from the purely pharmaceutical stuff that was prescribed to them and, and you know, things like the SSRIs, so lots of different brand names I probably shouldn't mention because they'll, they'll come up. Uh, but, you know, the gen generic kind of like, you know, the pills where you take them for two, three weeks and they, they eventually build up in your system and then you feel happy and you're not depressed anymore. And then you do that for six months and then you realize like, wow, I'm depressed again. But then you're you're almost like hooked on these pills. And that's, that's what a lot of big pharma like wants. That big pharma's job is to sell you pills, right? That's how they make their money. So the I guess sort of the renaissance that I'm quite heavily involved in is trying to find natural substitutes that people can grow themselves. It technically still is, you know, in sort of a gray area or, or maybe even not so gray. <laughs> area in most parts of the world so you got to kind of you know it's something you might not want to like advertise to your neighbors um, <laughs> but you know if you live here in thailand you like you know people here they don't really care what you do like my landlord as long as i pay the rent he he just came in yesterday to like fix the ceiling and he he saw everything i do and he just didn't he's just like yeah whatever does he doesn't care you know that's the great thing about living here is it's if you don't bother other people, they don't bother you. Right? Like unless you're doing something that's harming other people or you're being a jackass, you know, people don't really bother you, which goes back to the loneliness thing is because sometimes that can be like you feel very isolated um, unless you search for activities or people to meet. You can you can you can sit here and just be by yourself 24 hours a day and nobody will bother you. I'll put that in. I'll, I'll link your channel if anyone wants to go over and check out your your content. Let's leave it there, man. It's it's been an absolute pleasure to to talk to you and and to for you to share your story with us. So I'm really happy that you you came on here and I wish you all the best. Whatever happens okay. down the line for you, wish you all the best. Okay, thank you for having me on. Uh, remember my YouTube thing. If anybody wants to contact me, just look for my name. I should pop up. So I'll share that, it that down be below like for more. everyone to, to get in contact with you if they want to subscribe oh. to your channel. Okay. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. See you later. Ed. Take care. Bye-bye.